a newspaper mm. features writer, a, a columnist, a radio newscaster and reporter, a weekly radio talk show, oh. a television news anchor, an NBC affiliate uh, news division manager, and directed a nationwide television and public radio information program in the Ukraine. And Stephen has also designed and taught uh, on-ground and uh, online university classes, including MBA and uh, bachelor's degree courses in the real world. Stephen, are you ready to uh, uh, to uh, present your materials? I believe I am, if my audio is coming through okay. Sounds good. Let's do it. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for that nice introduction. And, of course, thank you, Chan, for all your work as always pulling this all together and it's really it's wonderful to be on such an esteemed panel there are so many smart insights uh, from the others including what we've heard so far from George and Bill and that takes some of the pressure off of me to sound uh, overly informative and smart especially sitting here next to Science Circle founding member Phil Youngblood I'm really looking forward to your part Phil so I'm just going to quickly jump into my subject today and it's what's happening Happening in academia and how we might do a reset of our prior experience with virtual worlds and especially from the perspective of university administrators and educators and students from around the world and of course tech companies that might help make uh, some great things happen but uh, here's the big bug in the academic room of course it's hard to look too far up ahead when we don't know how far down is going to be yet so there is a big question mark after just about everything I will be saying today yeah I do like this image if you look closely you can see a skull in the middle of the virus my goddaughter pointed that out to me this morning uh, I will be sharing some data and resources as we go, and much of all that comes from uh, this assortment of recent articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and some other credible sources. And I'll also be sharing links to some additional resources in some of the slides. And uh, you can down a, uh, download a PDF of these slides and uh, access the active links. There's a sign there, uh, uh, right there on the side of the screen. If you click that, it'll let you download the PDFs of these slides. I will be primarily focusing on U.S. news and issues, since that's where I'm at here in Southern California. But it's a pretty good bet that if it's happening here in academia, it is likely happening elsewhere, or at least they're suffering the fallout from it. Uh, it is important to define a few terms right here at the top, uh, especially as it relates to online learning and technologies. And These words get confused and conflated with one another, and it especially upsets us uh, though, uh, who have been working in online education for, for years and even decades. Uh, online courses, when I'm talking about that, uh, these have been years in the making. They're often, often uh, fully developed. They have readings and lectures and videos and discussions and immersive activities, and they've been carefully cultivated to serve their students. Remote courses, that's what we're talking about quite a bit in the media today, those uh, were an emergency response to COVID. Typically, it's a live course, often broadcast for one to three hours on Zoom, often by inexperienced instructors with low-tech skills, and of course, this leads to low student satisfaction. And we're seeing it in the uh, course evaluations for these remote courses. And students are even now asking for refunds or they're filing lawsuits to cover some of their tuition uh, because of their uh, sole experience with uh, remote courses rather than going back to campus. So then we have high flex courses and those are being introduced at uh, one of my universities. Uh, it's a uh, classroom broadcasts live online for two different audiences, one in the room and the other online. And this is an expensive high-tech option. It looks good in theory, but it does require high instructor skill and very little support. And one teacher remarked that uh, he teaches well in the classroom and he teaches well online, but if you put the two of them together simultaneously, we're going to fail at everything. And of course, administrators aren't happy 
happy to hear that kind of thinking. I'm also going to be briefly sharing some of my uh, own observations and experience working as an educator and course developer for some 20 years uh, at some large public and smaller private universities. And here's some of the courses and institutions uh, where I've worked. More than half of the courses have either been fully online or a hybrid mix of online and on ground. and. Uh, because of that, I've worked with a number of platforms and programs, some of the larger ones still around doing well, some of the smaller proprietary platforms are no longer with us. But it gives me a sense of what works, what administrators are looking for, and what students like, and those aren't necessarily all the same thing, of course. And uh, for some 15 years, I've also been experimenting uh, with educational bills and Second Life. Uh, for a couple of years, the Science Circle has let me huddle in a corner of this sim. Uh, while well, I've been setting up uh, some virtual learning demonstrations for my universities, trying to pull them in. Uh, you can get a landmark uh, to this, clicking that little eye on the uh, screen here. That'll give you a landmark. Uh, I'm just right over the hill here. I'm not hard to find. Um, and now it's time, let's go ahead, let's talk about what's happening in academia over the last year since the COVID crisis uh, began. Uh, it's been more of a morphing, really, than a revolution or a redesign. Uh, the transformational forces, well, these have already been at play for a long time. Uh, the lower state funding universities and colleges are suffering. The demographic dip in enrollments and administrators stressing over budget cuts and program reductions. And up to 30 uh, percent, I just saw this figure, up to 30 percent of a, a university's revenue may come from dorms and dining and that is a really big loss uh, right now uh also, uh, there is a lot of pressure to go ahead and cut more into tenure uh, and replace those expensive professors with adjuncts. So one dean just got in trouble in Colorado. Maybe you saw that story. Uh, he said, this is a great chance to shove out some of those tenured professors. Why waste a good pandemic, he said. Uh, and, of course, he got a pretty good lashing in the media uh, over that. Uh, these are uh, forces that have been uh, simmering and expanding for decades now, and, and now the blinds on many of our social systems are being lifted, and we get a clear uh, shot of just what's behind the curtain. Uh, and Zoom, of course, now is the hub of almost all my online classes everywhere. I'm teaching currently for four different universities. All of them are using Zoom. After a couple terms, I think we're doing better on it. But, you know, historically, academia doesn't move very fast. All the uh, instructors in the room, you know what I'm talking about. And when it does move, well, it doesn't always do it right the first time or even the second time. And I can't talk too much about the internal specifics, what's happening at my universities, but I can uh, at least share a few steps that they have released to the media. Uh, one of them, after uh, COVID closed the UCLA campus last spring term, they put up a virtual campus in Minecraft, and it was interesting to look at, but I don't think uh, they've done much with it. Uh, it is interesting to note this was paid for out of the Bruin Gaming Fund, uh, which I think uh, is indicative of something. And uh, National University, also where I teach, it recently implemented an artificial intelligence program that was touched on earlier today. Uh, they, they use the uh, software company Payback. Well, there is an intriguing, threatening name. Uh, the goal of this, uh, stated in the release here, is to better engage all the online students, which right now all of them is, are, and, and, and engage them in the course discussion and the tasks, and to provide, provide students with uh, suggestions on how to do better from an artificial intelligence source. Uh, this is supposed to help uh, instructors focus more on some of our other resources, it says. And it may worry some that it's just a sort, short step between augmenting instructors and actually replacing them. That may ultimately be where the artificial intelligence is going to be taking us. 
And then now uh, we need to consider, well, what do the students want? What are they expecting from us? What do they desire? What do they need? And the best way to uh, get to the heart of this is to better understand them. Uh, and in the 20 years that I've been teaching, let's see, I started at UCSB 20 years ago in 2000. It's exactly 20 years now. Uh, the largest group of students coming through uh, have been millennials. And as an aging hippie uh, from the 70s, I've always felt a special affinity with the millennials. Maybe we have some in the, uh, the audience today. Other older siblings, when I taught them, they seemed to more focus on careers and earnings, while the millennials seem more focused on issues. And they have this get over it attitude towards racism and sexism and intolerance that I really uh, admire. As hippies, you know, we protested against the war and for civil rights, and the hippies got beaten because we were long-haired and perhaps smelly and most likely drug users. But the millennials that we've seen protesting over the last uh, several months now, they've just been too cute to beat. They got cute shoes and they got cute backpacks and their moms were right alongside to protect them. And we really need to understand this new generation if we're going to serve uh, them well. And here's just a couple of interesting tidbits. Uh, those in the upper economic tier of millennials are about to inherit some $30 trillion from uh, the retiring and expiring boomers and that'll be over the next decade the next 10 years or so and more and more of these millennial heir heirs are saying they don't want that uber wealth they're going to be giving it away uh, there's more news uh, reports on this very topic including giving away what what they inherit is real estate and art and jewels and no doubt that is harsh news to their uh, elders that have spent lifetimes accumulating this wealth to hear their their offspring just wanting to give it away and that also that coincides uh, with this great bulk of millennials who were unable to find any jobs or certainly any well-paying jobs with any kind of future and many of them have become sullen and depressed and we see high rates of drug abuse and self-harm now, not everyone wants to go to school, but for those who do, we can certainly make learning more accessible, more inclusive, more fun, more relevant. Something to keep in mind is this is happening across the entire economic spectrum, and uh, futurologists are predicting by the year 2050 that intelli artificial intelligence and robots may uh, well in trench this new breed of people a useless class of people that are not just unemployed but unemployable there's just nothing for them to do and an interesting point in this article is they suggest virtual reality worlds might provide them with far more excitement and emotional engagement than the real outside world and this might work as a as a replacement for uh, the regular life they may have been hoping for. Uh, these virtual worlds, they also provide a sense of place and belonging. This is so important uh, to student success and retention. Uh, so much of our college experience, you know that, you remember that, even if it was decades ago, uh, is not just sitting in a classroom. Well, we can do that just about as well as being online. These, these students are look, looking to mix and mingle and experience the lifestyle and setting. They want to party and play. And the more we can connect with them in a context of place, the longer they will stay connected uh, with us. About three years ago, uh, we were talking about uh, Rosedale a little bit earlier today. About three years ago, I participated in a webinar uh, with Philip Rosedale. He was the CEO of High Fidelity at the time and founder of Linden Labs. Sansar was on the horizon. And they also uh, brought in tech ev evangelist Robert Scoble. And they were previewing some emerging uh, technologies, including Sansar. And uh, much of it has not seen the full light of day that's for sure uh, but a few things they did get right I asked them about uh, educational uses of the the new 3d immersive technology 
practical uh, excuses that they could see uh, instructors and in universities adopting. And they gave an in-depth response. You can find a link to the video. It's on the uh, screen here. There's also a transcript of the session notes. There were some really interesting uh, insights shared there. For one, you know, students are already using uh, augmented reality and virtual reality glasses and uh, participating on these very expensive programs, learning how to build uh, uh, track caterpillar tractors and Boeing jet engines and uh, studying principles of gravity between planets and you know uh, what's capable here. But the the problem with this is the cost of these virtual design platforms, these immersive platforms, are not cheap. Uh, the video for Grand Theft Auto 5 alone was $400 million. And to have effective virtual world learning expenses is also going to be costly. Um, but the costs... Uh, of simply doing what we're doing right now, simply hanging out and giving talks on a stage. Well, these are simple and inexpensive ideas, and, and uh, Scoble and Rosedale says it's events like this that are ultimately going to carry the day uh, where this physicality of place is just magical, they say. And so the question is, well, what do we do best in virtual worlds as educators? And this is it right here, right now. Look, here's a screenshot of an earlier uh, seminar here in the Science Circle Open Air Auditorium. It's this wonderful place. We have a real sense of being, a real sense of place. There's context and proportion and exploration and tactile interactivity and even games. And we just don't give that in a Zoom class uh, where every square uh, and flat face is in your face. That's a problem with it. It's an exhausting uh, synthetic abstract. I've done hundreds of these and it's a common complaint that these Zoom sessions are just exhausting. And I think that's part of it is it, it, it's just not real and our brains are trying to make sense of it. Whereas we have a much greater sense, I think, of place and being in these virtual worlds. So what do we need to do uh, to bring educators and academia in? Here are uh, a few of my suggestions uh, to those designing virtual worlds and technology uh, for educators. And first of all, it is really time to polish everything up uh, and rather than just seeking quick fixes and substitutes, academia is looking very, very hard right now uh, at uh, options. Online learning is not going to go away uh, now that we've seen the need and application of it. Many students uh, are, are uh, going to want to hang on to this. Many of them don't like uh, learning online, but more and more are starting to uh, demand it. And as academia suffers further and further cuts, they are going to be looking hard for cost-effective and student-pleasing options. Uh, the uh, educational platforms and, and uh, programs, well, they need to better understand the demands of academia. Uh, there are these old stodgy administrators that just don't understand the tech and just want to go back to the old days. Uh, but that's just not going to happen. Uh, and and the uh, some of the other issues they have well there's just there's no money for it there's no budget well there is a budget you just have to prove that it's worth the limited funds available uh, another one of their concerns of course as always is the overhead demands on students to have to learn new skills of a new platform the instructors to learn a new platform and this does have a pretty high learning curve we all know that and then there's also just the title nine horror over privacy and harassment and griefers in virtual worlds and the lawsuits that might come out of that if the students are mandated or required to participate. Uh, and there's also just plain performance standards that universities need to cover for accreditation, especially some of the higher tier universities. They want to protect their re uh, reputation. Now, I've been pitching virtual world learning to administrators for the some 15 years. I've been in uh, Second Life right around uh, with most of the old timers here. We've seen uh, the ups and downs of it. 
typically what uh, reply I get from administrators, well, there's just too much development time, too much cost, too high of a learning curve for teachers and students, and just too little practical use. So we need a uh, to ease up on access. Uh, we need to make creation easier. Uh, our invited and secured guests uh, should be able to click directly to a seat, with even without a membership, with a customized avatar even, uh, full cam function, and maybe minimal function of chat. And that should be just as easy uh, as the accessibility of Skype, where a single step gets you to where you need to be. Uh, we need the creative and simple filters of TikTok for designing. We need the functionality of Zoom, where slides and video and audio files are easily shared uh, with a single click. Uh, and uh, I think we also need to continue to counter the gaming bias. Of course, Second Life is not a game in the mind of its users, but others don't always see it that way. And so what? You know, learning can be fun and gamified. Uh, I suggest you check out Duolingo. Oh my God, daughter suggested this to me just two weeks ago. And I studied two years of Russian in college. I lived in Russia and Ukraine speaking the language, but I've learned more Russian in just a couple of weeks playing around with Duolingo than I did in all my years. Check this out if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. Really good example of how gamification works. We also need to keep in mind, unfortunately, that uh, new technologies always don't do what we hope they do. Uh, students were given access to network computers. Uh, but a Duke University found that uh, the test scores in reading and math were failing. Uh, and uh, students in the one laptop per child program were actually spending more time on games and less time on actual studies. Uh, and of course, we also work, have to work harder to bridge this digital divide, especially between rich and poor countries, uh, mostly sp split between northern and southern hemispheres and also between rich and poor communities. We also need to ensure that this digital divide isn't further compounded by the content divide. We need appropriate course materials that connect and resonate across national, cultural, economic boundaries, and that's an issue very dear to me. And yes, there are funding sources out there to help it. This development is very uh, expensive, but someone is going to do it, and someone's going to do it soon. Someone's going to do it fast. Uh, here's some of the government programs that uh, are supporting educational developments. And, of course, there's also foundations and the names that we know, Gates, Jobs, uh, Sailor. And uh, the schools are also going to be shifting money from uh, classrooms and facilities to new and better online options. You can be sure of that. There will be money for it. What we need to bring is a new a big picture and not just view from our own individual purchase. We need to appreciate the practicalities and realities of administrators. Now, sometimes we teachers. Some don't always do that well. Uh, we also need to understand the desires and needs of students. They're facing a very different world and future, future than we did. And we have to nurture the creative abilities and aspirations of educators. And we need to embrace the ultimate possibilities and immediate limitations of learning technologies. James, James Corbin, I saw him the other night on a, on a talk show, and he was saying, you know, we've tried imagining the possibilities, and it's working, and that is just an inspiring thought. And just one more last thought uh, from Wayne Gretzky as we look towards the future. Uh, let's not get distracted by where the puck is, but let's prepare for where it will be, uh, and uh, it might just all work out. Here are some references. If this is a topic uh, that, that uh, interests you, there are some additional references and resources you can uh, check out. There's the PDF file. If you click that little sign there, you get it with hopefully the active links that all work. There's a few more that uh, you can pick up on. And uh, here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to drop me a note. It has been a pleasure. Hopefully I've stuck pretty close to the 20 minute allotment and I'm gonna turn it back to Matt. Thank you so much, everybody. Woo, thank you so much. That was uh, fantastic, Stephen. Uh, man, you ran through a lot of stuff so quickly. You know, you mentioned one thing that uh, uh, kind of caught my attention uh, with your uh, uh, list of uh, sort of 
applications and tools we could use. You mentioned something about sort of limited chat functionality, and I just wanted to press you. What's what's your concerns about uh, chatting? Is it just the sense that it, people will end up sort of IMing each other all the time and not paying attention to the classes or something like that? Well, that's part of it, too. What I'm thinking is bringing people in that have had no experience whatsoever with the platform and, and making it easy for them. And what I mean limited chat is uh, if, if it's just a matter of I don't know how to do this and I don't know how to do that and can I fly and uh, uh, where, uh, where can I get some better clothes is that uh, you know, maybe they can be brought in. Uh, they can have like a gen General chat among themselves and then uh, during the presentation itself maybe moderated chat or something just to keep uh, just to keep uh, all the chatter down a little bit it's really hard to follow it you know as a presenter <laughs> uh, it is yeah and um, uh, just to kind of follow up and some comments I was making nearby chat is that um, uh, the I think that part of the fatigue that so many people complain about with these Zoom classrooms or Zoom meetings is, is in, in fact part due to the lack of immersiveness. I just don't think Zoom is immersive. So, you know, that, um, and just staring at your screen um, uh, and, or looking at the tiles of the different faces uh, is, you know, it's just gets boring and tedious um, and uh, so forth. And there are also some issues with the the interface of Zoom, I think, uh, a lot of times not all of the um, the uh, the attendance thumbnails display. You might have to pay sort of page through uh, to see who all is there because it doesn't. You know, not all of the thumbnails fit on the screen and things like that. And um, there are a lot of issues like that. And I do think that uh, one of the um, uh, you know one of the benefits of virtual worlds is the immersiveness you know i can spend all day on second life and not get exhausted but um you know i um you know before the lockdown i used to meet with my uh, buddies like once a month for a happy hour and that was fun and then with the lockdown we tried to continue the happy hours on zoom right and uh so that was pretty fun but you know, we would all sort of get sick of it after about, you know, an hour and a half. Whereas before, you know, in real life, we could go on all night. But um, uh, but it's just not the same on Zoom. And um, uh, but but I can hang out all day on Second Life and not feel, you know, quote unquote, exhausted by Second Life. And I attribute that to the immersiveness of it. So I think that is one of the I, I would just throw this out there. So that's one of the the key benefits of uh a virtual world um, uh, resource for teaching um, is that uh, you can, it does overcome uh, this uh, issue of just being exhausted or bored. Yeah, I think uh, I think you've nailed it right on the head, Matt. And no doubt there's going to be a lot of dissertations coming up over our experiences in the last <laughs> year. And uh, no uh, if nothing else, it's just as a, as an educator, and I've spent many years in the classroom. What we have in the classroom is a sense of proportion. You have the students in front that are engaged and and listening carefully, and then the students in the back that have this natural distance to them. You don't get that sense in Zoom. You very much get that sense of proportion and perspective here in Second Life. As a, as a presenter, as an educator, I think that makes all the difference. So thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, and I do, you know, I, uh, uh, as we touched on in the first hour, the issue of the avatars, you know, I remember uh, back when, um, oh, what's his name? I was holding his, um, his office hours here. Um, and he was mentioning that the Lindens were uh, highly cognizant of the challenge of um, uh, of, uh, of for newbies uh, to sort of figure Second Life out uh, and how to create an avatar. Like Second Life is not just a plug and play application. Uh, once you log in and create it, you create an account and log in, and you have uh, a default avatar. Um, uh, that's not good enough for Second Life. You really need to be able to customize your avatar, 
kind of like the way you do in any, like in a console game or something like that, uh, where you can, in those, you sort of select an avatar from a menu. Maybe you can select from a limited uh, library of outfits and so forth. But so there's a you know, kind of a minimum amount of customization. But Second Life really allows you to create any look or any appearance that you want. But it's not easy, especially with mesh. You know, I think mesh is, uh, has a very steep learning curve. So all of these are, this is all like a barrier to the wide adoption of a, of a platform like Second Life. Just the, the, the entry level barriers of complexity uh, make, it, uh, make it challenging. Uh, so there, apparently there's a lot of hand wringing about this uh, at Linden Labs about how to simplify all that, but I'm not sure that, not really sure that anyone has an easy answer to it though. Well, money makes everything easier, doesn't it? And maybe as the funding begins to flow, as this becomes recognized as the valuable source it will be, uh, we'll see greater investment. You know, that is an excellent point. I mean, one reason maybe it's so difficult is because uh, Second Life is still kind of a niche world and simply, the, you know, the demand simply isn't there. But uh, if the demand, like, you know, uh, so it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem, um, but but uh, perhaps um, a more widespread adoption of Second Life or some other comparable platform um, would, in fact, drive and motivate the creation or, or you know, even if it's just a matter of, of uh, having a, a much, much bigger library of kind of default avatars that you could adopt. Yeah. Even that would probably help a lot, I think. Well, I'd love to see uh, see the platform be Second Life. We've all invested a lot in it. But if it is some other platform that steps up and serves the need, I think we'll be equally uh, as happy to see that happen. Yeah. It kind of takes a commitment to Second Life to sort of figure out what you're going to do with it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's an important point. Even back in you know, 2008, 2010, I would tell people, you should have at least two different things you wanted to do in the world. To, to have a sufficient motivation to go through a steep learning curve, a horrible interface, which neither of which has been improved, and uh, and and you're right. Um, but also, I th well, I know that all of the major virtual worlds companies, including Linden Labs, Kiteley, and Science Space, they're all desperate to attract business interest to use this as a conferencing uh, space. You know shared workspace and so on and they all have same all, same problems um a friend of mine who is really familiar with the industry and all that saw the web page that linden lab has about hey your second life as your business venue uh, conferencing and so on and he said well look they can't have it with with these glossy new mesh avatars it looks like a porn game and businesses are not going to do that uh, same thing is going to apply with education and, and so on. So that's why I keep saying you really need to have high quality, realistic, functional avatars. Um, and that has many you know, difficulties involved, as we discussed. Yeah, it's all very true. Uh, I, I, I completely agree. But I've often, I've often wondered who does the marketing for the homepage for Linden Lab. Because it's obviously not oriented toward the age group that uh, is in Second Life. And it's not oriented toward education. It's not oriented toward business. It's <laughs> So I'm wondering if there's a disconnect somewhere out there. Boy, if I could jump in a moment on that one, uh, Phil. Uh, uh, and it's what I've been hearing uh, be, been said here. Where did business go? Where did academia go? Why aren't they jumping in? Why don't they get it? Uh, and really, uh, I think it's a matter of perspectives. Uh, do they really understand what the virtual world experience is about? I think they do. I mean, I've, I've been working with some pretty high-placed people bringing technology into education. But I think there's a difference in perspectives. The difference in our perspectives, those of us that have been here 
for 15 years. We do get it. We see it. We love the immersive uh, uh, aspects of it, the possible of 3D. But they're looking at it from a very different perspective. When I talk to the administrators and the decision makers, uh, I, I, we may see uh, the virtual world as this wonderful place that just happens to serve academics and business, whereas they're seeing it more as an ap academic tool that just happens to be in a virtual world. They don't have that same commitment. They're, they're not looking for a second life. They barely have enough time for the first. I think what they're really looking for is this immersive, explorative experience, but they want it to be accessible and easy and one click. And that's the disconnect. I think it's just a matter of the realities of it and also just just the different perspectives on how we're approaching this.